this morning as we come together, the Lord knows exactly what we need. And uh, he knows exactly where we're at. And so I, I want to just share with you today that um, we're, we're moving into the final, um, final message of stepping into the story of God. In fact, this morning we uh, we're at the point of the very final book of, of the scriptures, the book of Revelation. And as we, as we move into it, I'm reminded that the, the final book of Revelation is, uh, this final book of scripture, the book of Revelation is, um, is, is supposedly the end of the story, right? But actually, it's a, actually a brand new beginning. It's, it's an ending that's a brand new beginning. And as we just read the scriptures and you just heard them read, you, you see that that brand new beginning is a, a brand new creation. And, and so today, as I share the scripture with you, uh, I'm reminded of that today. Uh, I was reminded of a, a story um, that uh, Richard Foster uh, tells in, in one of the prayer books that I use quite often. And, and Richard Foster, in, in that story, talks about how he went to the northern part of England uh, for, a, for a time to, to visit with what he, what's called the North Umbria community, which is, um, which is a, a faith community there that, uh, that has taken a lot of their practices and their passion from uh, a 7th century Northumbrian monastic community from way back. Uh, and and uh, Richard uh, Foster says that um, uh, he, he went there uh, to investigate that community and to learn about it in, in the fall of 2001. Uh, maybe some of you can kind of add things up a little bit, but in the fall of 2001, of course, um, that was the time in which 9-11 took place. And so uh, Richard Foster was, was there, and, and one of the things that he wanted to do while he was in the Northumbrian area was go see the, the, the cave of Cuth Cuthbert. Um, Cuthbert was a uh, one of the monastics who had a great evangelistic passion and who uh and who drew very close to the lord and they named a cave after him uh where he would spend time in solitude and in prayer and and so he wanted to visit that cave and he did he went up and and spent time there and in fact he had a lot of meetings and a lot of activity a lot of things were going on in his in his life during that time as he was meeting with that community and so he just wanted some solitude but as he went up the, to the cave, he, um, he found himself in these moments uh, not only wanting to withdraw because of, of the need to get away and have this solitude was just to have time with the Lord, but also he, he found that in these moments that um, all of this was erupting inside of him. He was far away from home and uh, across the, the ocean in England when in here in America, the Twin Towers had just collapsed and and when people had jumped to their deaths and all those kinds of things that were just horrific for us to see and he goes on to to write about how it was just such an ironic kind of place for him to be in this real quiet uh, place of solitude in this cave of Cuthbert uh, while all of this was erupting in the United States and and how um, he was so far away and yet his heart was there just hurting with the folks that that uh, he knew in the states that were struggling and and just hurting for those he didn't know uh, but one of the things that he said as he was in that cave is he he began to ponder how how blatant the evil was that had been unleashed and, and um and he said i consider how considered how blatant evil once unleashed will by its very nature produce even more evil Terrible as the scenes of the last days, he said, uh, that I had watched had been, they may well have only been the beginning, he, he goes on to say. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, yes, that's true. I mean, um, even those, those horrific scenes were terrible, but we know that the, the rise of ISIS took place <laughs> and, and the fall of ISIS that has happened since that very time. And he went on to say that unrestrained evil seems so powerful and, and so overwhelming. And, and what can we pray in a time like this when there's this kind of overwhelming evil as he was sitting in that cave, 
contemplating it. And he said, all I can say is all that we can pray is, Lord, have mercy. And so uh, as he's sitting in that cave and he's <clears throat> contemplating what's going on with <clears throat> the evil in the world uh, and all that's going on with it, he, he comes to a realization that even in this cave that he's sitting in, even there, uh, there's been terror in the past. In fact, uh, uh, the Vikings had raided the villages and people had carried Cuthbert's uh, body up to that cave in order to keep it from being desecrated. And men and women were, were killed in the villages and the villages were raised. And, and he was reminded that even though it seemed ironic, he was in this quiet place, even this quiet place where he was where he was trying to find solitude had been a place that violence and oppression had, had visited as well. It had been a place that had known the, the horrors of evil. He, he actually uh, quotes a, an old, old country bluegrass gospel song. Maybe Marty Schaus might know it. I don't know. But um, he, he quotes a line of it. He says, truly, there's no hiding place down here. and um, there's no doubt about that, that, that there really is no place where we're not touched by, by oppression and evil and struggle. But then he went on to say that in the midst of, uh, of his time in that cave, all of a sudden, unexpectedly, he, he heard the sound of, of hope, he said. And it was, a, it was the unexpected sound of a, of a metal lark that, was, that, that began to sing its song in the middle of that cave. And, and uh, and Richard Foster says that it wasn't the time of year or the right place for a metal lark even to show up at all, but he could hear it again unmistakably as it as it as it sung its song again. And and he says this about that. He says there it is, the unmistakable, clear whistling song, so simple, so clear, so strong. It, it sings to me of beauty, of hope, and of a future beyond all evil and all devastation. Perhaps, he says, it, it is, and by faith, I take it to be a word of encouragement that has come, has come to me from the heart of our, my loving God. And then he says this, he says, and so the song of the meadowlark frees me to begin praying that the ocean of darkness threatening to engulf us today will in God's time and in God's way be overcome by the far greater ocean of God's light and God's life. I think that um, Richard Foster's time in that cave, the uh, Cuthbert's cave, it really helps draw us in to the understanding of Revelation uh, this morning, especially as we get to Revelation 21 and, and 22. And as we look over the book of Revelation, we, we really can see that the, the, the people that, that uh, John is writing to the, the the churches in Asia Minor are are people who are facing difficulty and struggle. Uh, in, in fact, um, all of them are are facing great pressure and and they know the the symbolism that John is using as he writes through the book of Revelation very well. They they would understand the, the bizarre kinds of symbols he uses. For example, John talks about the beast and about the dragon in Revelation. <clears throat> and they would have understood the beast in their lives. They would have understood the dragon. Uh, they would have understood that, that, that their emperor was a, really a beast, uh, a dragon. They would have understood that, that Rome was oppressing them. Of course, we know it's way beyond just, uh, just uh, the emperor that really would be talked about there. It really was underneath it all the... the the very presence of Satan and of the devil himself that was animating these powers that be that were bringing oppression upon the people. And so as, as John is writing to the, 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 the people of the book of Revelation, that, that the people of Asia, Asia Minor, uh, we, we find that, um, uh, that in the midst of it, John is helping them to see that in the midst of all the the difficulty and the struggle that that there is a, a there's a song that's being sung. In fact, in chapter 21 and 22, we we see the that the song of the book of Revelation is a song that's 
that's sung in the midst of the darkness of the cave and the darkness of discouragement and the darkness of struggle. And, and, as, we, and as we read it and continue to move forward in it, we, we see that as we read these words, um, where the ocean of darkness was threatening the people that John was writing to, writing to uh, their darkness was overcome by the far greater ocean of God's light and God's life. I, I think this, that it, that if you read the book of Revelation, and um, in reading it, you, you see it as a book of doom and gloom, I think you've misread it. You've misunderstood it. Um, because in the book of Re Revelation, we, we see an ending that is a brand new beginning. Uh, we, we hear the song of the meadowlark in Cuthbert's cave, and the, the book of Revelation sings of the beauty and of the hope and of a, a future that's beyond all evil and all devastation. And yes, it is future, no doubt, but we, we realize that this is an amazing hope that has also begun in us. If we've come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have become a part of the new creation. Uh, we, we have become people who have become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Amen? <laughs> what a wonderful thing that is. And so this hope that we see in Revelation 21 and 22 it is something that we've already begun to taste of. We, we've already entered into it. It's, it's interesting when I think about this being a story that, that at its ending is just beginning. It reminds me of all the sequels that we, that we see, um, you know, Spider-Man or Superman or Star Wars, right? You know, how many, how many, um, how many sequels of Star Wars are there? Anybody know? <laughs> I won't ask. Um, probably I'll have a bunch of answers back here on Zoom. But, but when we look at those, um, the ending of them always leaves you at a place where you know there's going to be a brand new beginning. Uh, where the fight will, will begin again and the action will, will really heat up. And the book of Revelation is, is a book that, at, at the end of it, it's, it's, there's a new beginning, but it's different than the sequels we see with the superheroes in Star Wars. In Star Wars, at the very end of the day, what we find is the new sequel is, is not something brand new. It's just the, a new way of fighting the old battle. We just find a new segment of fighting the old battle that we've been fighting all along. But in the book of Revelation, we find a very different kind of sequel. In the book of Revelation, we see that the ending that becomes a new beginning is not about a new battle. In fact, the battle has already been won. In fact, could I tell you that actually the battle that has been won really has been won before the very first page of the book of Revelation? has ever been written. Uh, we, we can see this and we, we understand it because we see in the book of Revelation constantly, it, it points to the lamb on the throne. We read that just a little bit ago. And the, the lamb who is uh, on the throne is the lamb that was slain. And this lamb that was slain is, is the one who is now worthy to open the seal on the scrolls. He's, he's the one who is able to redeem and forgive uh, all people. He's the, the lamb that was slain from the beginning of the world is Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus Christ, we know, has already won the victory. Amen? He already has won the victory. In fact, we, we, we see that in the scripture as we, we read through it, and we, we see that when we, we look at scripture that there's the this idea of the battle between the dragon and the, 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 the lamb. And, and we see that Jesus is taken to the cross and, and really the dragon and the beast is always animated in the powers of our world. So often it is. And so we see all the powers converging on Jesus, thinking that they can overcome him, thinking that they can just squash him. And he's just a revolutionary that will go by the wayside. But what we see is as Jesus comes to the the, really the final part of the battle as he's walked on the face of our earth for three years, he goes to the cross. And when he goes to the cross, he's now hanging there and, and he's saying his final words and his very final breath 
before he takes that final gasp, he says these words, and I think you probably know what they are. It is finished. And actually, Jesus is actually, we believe, praying a prayer of Psalm 22 while he's on the cross. Go back and read it sometime. And Psalm 22 is a prayer for those who are struggling under affliction, and they're praying for deliverance. And there's a real struggle going on. And we see that at the very end of that psalm, there's a sense of confidence as uh, the psalmist realizes God does, does bring victory for them. And, he, and so he proclaims the Lord's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying, he has done it. And then we are reminded that we just read those words just a moment ago, where it said in chapter 21, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus was slain far before the, the revelation of John was written. The victory was already won. It was already, the battle was already over. And that's why when you read Revelation and you see all the battles and the dragon and the beast, and you're looking for the big, big battle, it's anticlimactic, right? Pastor Joe shared that on his reflection this week. It's anticlimactic because the victory has already been achieved. Jesus has already won the battle for us. Praise God for that. And what a wonderful thing that is for us. And so we can see what this message meant for the first Christians of Asia Minor. They were going through great struggle and difficulty. Um, places like Ephesus and Smyrna and Laodicea, they needed to hear this message of hope. They needed to be reminded of where their victory really was lying through the lamb that was slain, through the lamb, the lamb that had been sacrificed, Jesus Christ. And we can even see as we look forward in this, how this message speaks to us today. Maybe we've been going through the cave of, of difficulty and oppression and discouragement. In fact, I really think that we all go through that at one time or another, don't we? In fact, the, the, the truth of the matter is, 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 as we walk through this life, there's, there's moments in which the, the old creation, the old dragon and beast, Satan, the devil himself, trying to tempt and test and, and trying to lure us, uh, brings a sense of oppression in our lives. And, and we find that the old creation that we live in can be crushing, can crush us. But we also find in the very same breath, as we read the end of the book of Revelation, that the new creation, the new creation of God, in the midst of an old creation that seeks to crush us in discouragement and in despair and in anxiety and in fear and in, in all of those kinds of things, in condemnation and in shame. In all of these ways, the old creation seeks to crush us, but, but in Revelation, we see the picture that there's a new creation and a new song that's being sung, sung in the caves of our discouragement that gives us hope, a new creation that, that tells us and calls us into a new way. It calls us to step into the way of the lamb that was slain in a world where the beast and the bullies are seen as the, the winners who think they can take all. The, the, the new creation calls us to step into this new creation of God in the middle of our dragon-infested world. You see, the, there's this old creation world of ours, it, it can crush us. I think as we've walked through these days, that maybe you would um, agree that uh, sometimes there's been some real anxiety, some real struggle. There's some sense in which when we're isolated like this and we're going through times like this and ec the economy is uncertain, all of these things are, are seemingly up in the air. It can feel as, as though in our distance and our isolation and our anxiousness, it can feel as though that, that, um, that we're just not winning. We're not succeeding. We're not overcoming. The old creation crushes 
but the new creation calls us to sing the song in the midst of the caves of discouragement and despair and chaos. Uh, yes, that old creation can crush our lives, but really it cannot if we have walked into the new creation of Jesus Christ and walked into the liberation of the children of God. It's interesting in this the passage, and I just want to point out to you, there's, there's three things that can never be in this new creation in its fullness and fulfillment in the future. The first one, if you, you read it, for me anyway, it kind of bothered me when I first when I first read it and thought about it, first of all, in this old creation, there can, there's no, no, no longer going to be any sea, the scripture says. I don't know about you, but I love the sea. I, I like the ocean. Um, but that's not what, the, that's not what John is, is writing about. That's not what the vision is about. In fact, I think there probably will be oceans and seas maybe in the new creation of God. But, but what the, not being any sea really referred to is the ancient Near Eastern mindset in which they would see the, the sea as the place of chaos and turbulence, the place where, where the sea monsters might rise up and, and clutch them and pull them under. And so the, the new creation will be a place where there's no chaos, where there's no turbulence, and where, where the, the beast can't reach up and clutch us and tear us down and crush us once again. But then the secondly, it says there's not only no longer any sea, no longer any turbulence and chaos of which we, we are enmeshed in, but there no longer will be any night. No longer any night. Uh, well, night represents the powers of evil and sin and brokenness and Satan. And the, the, it represents the dragons and the beasts and the wars and the power plays and all of our world. And, and so what, what John's vision says is that there will be no longer any night in the new creation. And then finally, there'll be no longer any curse. The curse of sin and death has been broken. No longer any curse. In fact, there, there are some things that just cannot be in the new creation of God. And I'm glad for that, aren't you? At first, when you read it, you, you read that, that there's not going to be any sexual immorality or those who are sexually immoral. There's not going to be any, any idolaters and there's liars and deceivers and nothing impure will be there, the scripture we read earlier tells us. In fact, the fact of the matter is, is in the new creation of God, when we get to that future, there will no longer be any curse, no longer be any night, no longer be any chaos and turbulence, and there will be no evil. And I tell you, that's a great, great, great thing. It's a great piece of news for us this morning as we are meeting here on Zoom. Uh, I know it's not great news for those who choose the way of the dragon and the way of the beast, but it sure is great news for those of us who know Jesus Christ. And I'm reminded, I was reading in Ezekiel this week, that, that God doesn't de desire the death of anyone. And so he's always trying to call us into this new creation, isn't he? Even if we're living in sin. There's some very real consequences of living our lives in the way of the old creation, in the way of the beast. And, and, and so it's, it's interesting. In fact, I think it's interesting that um, N.T. Wright actually, he, he actually says that, that it, those things can't exist there. It would be kind of like if, if you would, um, you 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 would allow radio music to be played at the at, at, in a in a concert hall, and uh, or you, if you would allow smoking in a library, they don't belong there, <laughs> right? And and so those things that no longer can be in this new creation are um, are things that we're grateful for. But in the new creation of God, we are called to sing the song of forgiveness and freedom for all comers. We're called to, to, to sing the song of the fact that death has been defeated and, and death has been defeated through death itself as the lamb who was slain entered into death for us. And we sing the song of healing for the nations. And we sing the song that one day there will be no more mourning or crying or pain, period. Of course, we experience it now, but one day we will not. 
We sing the song because we no longer belong to the ways of the old creation. We're living into the new creation of God in these very moments. We who have become new creation in Christ are, are actually bearers and signals and signs to our world of that new creation that one day will come into full bloom. I don't know about you, but as I look out in my yard uh, yesterday, I don't know about today because I haven't looked, there's buds um, on the trees. And, and I was looking at those yesterday and I was, they, they just look like they want to just burst forward and burst out and the, the leaves to pop out of the, those buds. And I, and I was reminded as I looked at that, that, that those buds are on these trees that look so dead. And that's kind of who we are as Christians in the middle of this old creation world. We're the buds on the ends of the branches that are the sign and signal that the new creation is, is soon to burst into full bloom. What a, what a great picture that is. Paul calls us the first fruits of the new creation. And, and this vision of this future is not merely future. It can never be fully just future. We actually enter in to this new creation today. As I said, as we started, we become new creations in Christ Jesus. And as we become new creations in Christ Jesus, we've already begun to live in to that amazing and good future where we know the peace of God in our lives and where darkness no longer reigns in our lives. And, and this place where we uh, do not have to live with all the consequences of the brokenness of the curse, because God has done a work through the power of the Lamb who was slain for our lives. Well, we do still live in this old creation world, but we are new creation people who are singing the song of hope in the middle of the, the cave of discouragement and despair and difficulty. We're the people of the new creation and we live in the middle of the old creation. We don't belong to its power politics. We don't belong to its longing for domination and control. We don't belong to its rat race, seeking to beat the other so that we can just be, become the next king of the hill. No, we sing a different song and we march to a different drummer and we're running a very different race. Of course, I think this can be challenging for us as a church. This can be challenging because within the church, there are times that we don't always live up to our new creation calling. We're the people of new creation, but we don't always get it right. In fact, we can see that, that as we look on the history of the church of Jesus Christ, there's been scandals of financial impropriety and sexual infidelity and oppressive power plays for control that have been all too common. And so I think of that warning for us as a church that here we're called to be a sign of the new creation, the buds that will the signal that one day it will all bloom into full, into full leaf and color. But we must get this right. My heart is the world needs for us to get this right. Our world needs to be able to hear the song sung in the cave of our old creation. It needs to see the song sung in our lives and hear it through our lips of God's goodness and God's justice and God's righteousness and God's beauty and God's wholeness and holiness and God's love in a world that can't see past the cave walls of our old creation. But I will say this, there's another warning. When we do live out this new creation life, there's going to be resistance. Even sometimes within the religious community, there can be resistance. In fact, we can see that. In fact, the book of Revelation talks about Jesus as the faithful witness but also, Pastor Joe shared that devotional this week about the faithful witnesses, uh, the, those who um, give, give their lives uh, over for 
the sake of the lamb who was slain and follow that very same path. And when I look at the New Testament, I see all kinds of individuals who paid the price, people like James, the brother of Jesus, or Stephen, both of them who were stoned. And Stephen, who is stoned, is singing the song. He's singing the final stanza of the song of new creation, even as the final stone is hurled that takes his life, as he looks up and says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. They don't know what they do. Reflects the words of Jesus on the cross as well. The Apostle Paul sang the song of new creation while the powers of the old creation were exercising their fury upon him as he was beaten and stoned and imprisoned and left for dead. And the, the, the real warning for us here is not only that we might miss it as a church and we need to live into that new creation, but also that if we do live into it, we're going to suffer the consequences of the resistance. I think of even those in our day, uh, not far back, Martin Luther King Jr., who sang the song in the middle of a racist world and it, it, it cost him his life. Or Bishop Desmond Tutu uh, of South Africa and Nelson Mandela during the oppressive days, days of apartheid, as they were singing the song. Bishop Desmond Tutu would write, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. I think that's a great statement. Well, as we, as we think about Richard Foster's journey to Cuthbert's cave and the metal art that broke into song in the middle of the cave walls, that, reverberate, that were reverberating with the old creation of 9-11 and, and the, the dragons of the 7th century as well. I'm reminded um, that today, in the midst of our, our struggles in our caves and our difficulties and COVID-19 and whatever we face, that God is calling us to be signs of of the new creation that is breaking out. He's calling us to, to grow deeper in this new creation work of, of his and this restoration project. We don't live in a utopia. We don't ignore the fact that we face difficult things. No, we walk into our broken world. Now, actually, as, uh, Richard, uh, as Richard Foster was there in North England, there's also an island that sits just off of the coast. It's actually a tidal island, and, and they use that island as a, a place for the religious community to grow in their spiritual fervor, but at, at high tide, it would, cover, it would cause it to be an island, but at low tide, uh, as low tide would go out, you could cross from the island directly onto land. It became a peninsula of sorts. And, and there are many who say that that was a great symbol of that community of faith that was so evangelistic and was trying to so hard to live faithfully for the Lord and, and be a symbol of new creation because they would gather together on that island and they would gather around the slain lamb, Jesus Christ. They would, they would gather together and, and, they would, and they would draw close to God in the high tide moments. But they also knew that they weren't going to remain there the low tide would come when they would walk out into their world and they would speak and they would sing the song of God's grace and goodness. As we come to the end of this, I, I just see all kinds of imagery from the Old Testament that's reflected here in, 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 John's, in John's writing in these last two chapters. We see that it's like a new Garden of Eden. Uh, as we go to chapter one and two of Genesis, we see now it's a city, it's a garden that God draws his people towards this new creation. But we also see the picture of the river that flows down the center of the city. And it reminds us of Ezekiel and his vision in chapter 47 of Ezekiel, where, where as you recall, the, the waters began to flow off from under the, the, the temple, uh, the temple threshold and out into the barren wilderness. And as they as, as the water went out into the wilderness, it began to bring life wherever it touched that barren wilderness. And it finally flowed all the way down to the very 
place of the Dead Sea and that water was getting deeper and wider and it came into the Dead Sea and that dead old sea became filled once again with life. And it's a picture for us that John is also giving us that, that we as the sign and symbol of God's new creation are, are a part of that river. We've entered that river and now our lives are beginning to touch all the dead places in our world. Well, we know that Revelation 21 and 22 will never come to their complete fruition until the day of Jesus Christ and his coming again. And I think we need to look to that day. We need to be excited about that day. But as we look to that day, wherever we go and whatever we touch and whatever we say, as we walk in the way of the lamb that was slain, it brings life to our world. We sing the song of new creation and the caves of doubt and despair and destruction and death. And so, as I share with you this morning and as we close, I'm reminded of this today that um, we live in a world where people really need hope. And people really are so tired of the old creation. A lot of people are tired of just being cabined up in their house right now. But more than that, we're tired of the brokenness, the death, and the sin. And we are given the tremendous opportunity to sing the song that one day will become a crescendo around the throne of the Lamb who was slain. A lamb that looks weak, but that self-giving love conquers all things, conquers our hearts, conquers our lives. So are you singing that song this morning? Are you walking in the way of the lamb that was slain? Or have you been tempted by the way of the dragon, trying to grab the rings of power? in our world? Have you stepped into the very heart of God and found his rescue and his freedom? If you have, then most certainly you are singing the song of new creation. And I rejoice with you today. And we await the day of the full orchestra and the full choir around the throne of every nation, tribe, and every tongue, singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. But if you cannot sing that song of new creation this morning, I'd like to invite you into a brand new life, a life of new creation in Jesus Christ. Yes, we still live in the old world of old creation where we see broken dreams and broken hearts. But right smack dab in the middle of it, we're invited into the brand new life to become a new creature in Christ. As Christians, though, I, I pray that we would take the warning. It's always tempting to take the way of the dragon instead of the way of self-giving love and the way of the lamb. It's always tempting to grab for the rings of power. But may we be a people who are in the way of the lamb that was slain. And may we be a people that never quit singing the song, no matter what cave we may find ourselves in and no matter where we may go. So I'd like to pray with you this morning as we close. And it's a little bit different for me to preach on this format. I think a little harder, actually, <laughs> for me to do that. But, but I pray that somehow a nugget of God's grace and work uh, just penetrated into your heart. I'm so grateful that Jesus loves us so much and that he desires for us to know the power of his self-giving love. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I'm going I'm to ask you to ask him into your heart to allow him to cleanse you and bring you into his new creation and make you a new creation today. And if you already know him, I'm praying that you will be encouraged that no matter what may come, you have a song to sing. And don't quit singing it no matter what may come. Let's pray. Father, I pray today for <clears throat> those who 
who maybe have not asked you to become their savior and asked you to make them into a new creation. We've kind of come to the end of our story, and yet it's the beginning of a brand new story because that new creation, one day we will reign with you. We're not just going to be sitting around on clouds. We'll be reigning with you, and it will be life, and there will be no death there, and there will be uh, nothing impure and nothing unholy and nothing destructive. It will be your pure, pure love that we can't even hardly get our hands around, our minds around today as we think about it. But Father, I pray today, if there's anyone that doesn't know that love, that they would ask you to come into their heart and forgive them of their sin. And Lord, you would do your work in their life. And then Father, for us as believers, uh, in you, Jesus, we pray that we would recognize and point and, and realize when the way of the dragon is crouching at our door, when the enemy is tempting us, and that we would always take the way of the lamb, no matter what that we would never fight fire with fire, but that we would fight fire with the love of God that forgives and, and blesses our enemies and prays for those who persecute us. So Father, we give you praise and thanks. May you guide us as your community of faith in these coming days. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.